here on Shakedown, you love production-based race cars. We do too, as evidenced by our most recent visit to the Pirelli World Challenge in Detroit. Hope you saw that video. And by extension, you seem to like touring cars, like the British Touring Car Championship, officially called the Dunlop MSA British Touring Car Series. British Touring Cars has a long history. It started in 1958 as the British Saloon Car Championship, which I assume was the country's first designated driver program, you know, with the large number of pubs, saloons, and bars in Great Britain. Ken Gregory, the manager of racing great Sterling Moss, was the founder of the series, because I guess Sterling and his friends were heavy drinkers. When the designated drivers started to race their drunk passengers home, the series decided it would be safer to move the proceedings to the racetracks of England. Now, I may have the BTCC history a bit wrong there, and my apologies to Mr. Moss for calling him a fish-eyed sow. Where was I? British touring cars. In the 1950s, saloon car racing was very popular in England, but not organized. This national series fixed that and gave the leading British manufacturers, recovering from post-war years, a display ground to project their automotive prowess. Great cars into the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and great drivers like Jimmy Clark, who's doing his Chris Harris moment thing better than Chris Harris. And Americans too came to race. Richie Ginther, Dan Gurney, and Steve McQueen. As early as 1961, Dan Gurney raced a V8 Chevrolet Impala at Silverstone, the big boats. And by 1963, several Ford Galaxies were in the UK Championship. And ultimately, Gurney's lead would be followed by teams campaigning Ford Mustang, Ford Falcon, and Chevy Camaros. In 1963, your Jack Sears from England was champion again, this time at the wheel of the mighty Ford Galaxy. 64 and 65 brought more American thunder to British saloon racing. So why am I talking all this British touring car and American backstory? Because I read on jalopnik.com that American Rob Holland will be the first U.S. racer back in that series since some guy named Bill Gubbleman, Gutenberg, whatever, took a Ford Capri to the British Touring Car Grid in 1975. Now, Rob Holland is doing the next two races, Snetterton and Knockhill, in August, and testing his S2000 class spec Honda Civic in a few days. Rob came from the Pirelli World Challenge Series, so he's a production car veteran. Jalopnik ended their story with the snark, we're rooting for him now, Rob, and we'll wish him a speedy recovery if he does put that Honda in the wrong place. Really? I think we can do better than that and do more than just cheerlead by talking with Rob via Skype and getting the inside story into the British Touring Car Series from his perspective and his first attempt to race from a passenger seat. Yeah, that was a right-hand drive joke. And I haven't even started on the jokes with a team called Hard and tracks called Knock Hill. You know what? Just come back after the break. We'll talk to Rob. You all know that British Touring Car is home for a ton of manufacturers. Honda Civic, like Rob Holland, is going to race. Ford Focus, Toyota Avensis, Audi A4, MG6. Jason Plato is running that this year. And Vauxhall. I'm assuming just a rebadged Chevy Cruze since they pulled out of the series, as they're going to do with World Touring Car Championship as well. British Touring Car is 10 races over the year. The next two are Snetterton, a complex course, and Knock Hill. All of them in August. Faster, higher speed. Rob Holland's taking on those two tracks. Enough about me doing the setup. Let's go right to Rob Holland and listen to his story about his first foray into British touring car racing. So here we are with Rob Holland. Rob, you're in England right now, yes? I am in England right now as we speak. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. Um, in my intro, I had mentioned that, that Americans before you way before Bill Glickenhaus or wherever that guy is from uh, 1975, um, Richie Ginther, Dan Gurney, Steve McQueen, and now yourself, great Americans, uh, have raced over there in a British touring car. I have to ask you, why do you hate America that you have to leave our country to race? What's going on here? No, no such thing at all. I just, I fell in love with British Touring Car Championship years ago. In fact, it's, it's actually why I got into racing in the first place. Um, I love the racing. I love the cars. I love the historic tracks out here. And it's, it's why I became a touring car driver. And it's also why I've stayed in touring car for so many years is, is I love, I love everything about it. And um, this was kind of the culmination of a, of a lifelong dream, pretty much. So to come over here and, and, uh, and race with these guys is just going to be phenomenal. Well, we're going to touch a little bit on, on some of your previous experience in, in Pirelli World Challenge 
and where I think you raced the Volvo C30 and a Honda. So that yeah. begs the next question. Um, is Honda helping you, in fact, expatriate more Americans away from our country and take them overseas? I wouldn't say that, but oh, yeah, okay. they're definitely uh, helping me out. Lee Defenegger over at HPD has been great and really tried to do whatever he could to, uh, to help facilitate this. And it's great. I've had a great relationship with them and uh, through the Compass 360 team over a number of years. I raced with Compass 360 uh, and Grand Am and then also in, in World Challenge at the beginning of this year. So um, I, I really appreciate all their support. Um, and without these guys, I mean, it, it, it couldn't happen. So, Rob, I don't want to infer to anyone that you're running away from Pirelli World Challenge. I mean, the experience has given you the grounding to get here where you are. Talk to me a little bit about World Challenge and, and, and really how it works. A lot of people maybe think it's just a stepping stone series or it's just for the big Cadillac factory team in the Volvo. There's a lot going on. Talk to me a little bit about Challenge. Yeah, World Challenge has been great. I mean, it's a series that's been around for, you know, uh, 30, 40 years almost, I think now. And, um, you know, it's it's got everything. I mean, it's got it's got the factory teams. It's got some of the best drivers. Um, you know, it's got obviously great TV coverage, great fans, great exposure. And, um, you know, from from the beginning, it was it was a great opportunity for me. Um, you know, not not just as, uh, you know, a driver looking to kind of, you know, increase his exposure and awareness, but um, also just the, the level of competition that you get introduced to there. And both the Pirelli series and the Dunlop series, they're on real race tires. So we're, we're transferring that knowledge. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's a whole nother level of, of things that you've got to think about now. I mean, the tires are completely different than the, the old uh, Toyota R888s that we used to run in the Challenge. A true racing slick handles completely differently and it requires a completely different setup and a completely different mindset going into it. So, Working with the engineers here, I mean, even even though the Pirellis and the Dunlops, I mean, they're, they're race slicks, they're two totally different tires. So, uh, learning how those tires react to setups and what they like and don't like, uh, whether it's operating temperature or slip angle or whatever, I mean, that's the things that you work with with the engineer. I met you at Laguna, and um, um, I'm certain proportions, and you look like some footballer ready to replace uh, Rooney on the uh, English team. How did you get into racing? I mean, take us all the way back. How'd you start this? Well, it, it's actually funny. I started in a completely other sport that my size is actually a detriment to, as I was a professional cyclist a while ago. So um, it did that for a number of years, and uh, and then just got burnt out. It was a lot of travel, a lot of uh, a season just lasted from February to October. So you're just, you're always on the road, and it was more, too much more of a lifestyle. And um, so I retired from that, and uh, I just I found myself missing being competitive. I'd always been a bit of a gearhead. I'm not really sure why. My my parents aren't car car guys. My you know my my family, no one in my family likes cars. Uh, you know we're we're trying to track down the milkman and see if he's got like an Alfa Romeo tucked <laughs> away in the garage or something. But um, I uh, you know I basically uh, decided to go to Skip Barber uh, to learn how to race cars because I just miss being competitive. And uh, it, it turned out that I was. Uh, I was better at racing cars than I was at racing bikes. And we are 10 years down the road and I'm making a living at it. And without getting too sidetracked, but, but tell our fans, obviously the other part of the profession is, is finding the money and finding the partners to, to get in a race car and stay there. And, and you've done a pretty good job of that. You raced with KPAX, a very successful World Challenge team in their, in their C30 program, right? I did. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it was such a great opportunity with those guys. I was with them uh, way back when, uh, when it was 3R racing, racing for uh, with Dodge in Pirelli World Challenge, and uh, kind of went our own separate ways after a couple of years after that Dodge program ended. And then I ended up back last year with, with 3R racing, which which was K-Pax racing and running the, the Volvo C30 in, in touring car. And I uh, had a great, great uh, experience with them. Uh, the car was, was ridiculously competitive after midpoint of last season. Uh, you know, my teammate and I took a bunch of wins, uh, a bunch of track records. So it was a it was a great opportunity there. Unfortunately, that program ended. Um, Volvo, I think, is going more to the S60 as their as their racing platform now. Um, so I was kind of left stranded at the beginning of the year without without a ride. So we segued from the C30 into the Compass front drive Honda, and now you're going to be in a Honda Civic, the the European generation Honda Civic in the S2000 class of British Touring Car, correct? 
Yeah, no, there's there's multiple classes and, and there's there's a big difference. Um, the, the cars we race in Pirelli World Challenge are a lot closer to the, the street cars. Um, there's limited modifications you can do to them. So they're very, very close to being street cars. Uh, going over to here in British Touring Car, they've got uh, two different specifications. The first specification they've used is the specification that the FIA has demolgated over the past several years, which is the S2000, which was used in Touring Car and at, in World Rally competition as well. Um, they're still based on street cars. It's a, it's a street chassis, but a lot of modifications to the suspension. Um, what British Touring Car decided, though, was that even that specification, even though they were trying to limit the cost there, was the costs were kind of creeping, as they have a tendency to do in, in, uh, in racing. And it was just getting very expensive. So what British Touring Car wanted to do was go to uh, a specification that was going to be a lot easier to build, a lot easier to maintain, and a lot easier to repair in crashing. So obviously that's, that's something that happens in, well, and that's the, not infrequently. <laughs> and that's the new generation Touring Car. And, and like German Touring Car, where they cut maybe 30%, 40% of the budget and still had a competitive car, they're trying to do that with, with the new generation Touring Car. You're running the S2000 spec. So this is your chance to cover your ass. Is there a disadvantage in being the older grandfather spec, or, or are you right there? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to throw <laughs> that out there right now. It's, it's, it's going to be a struggle. No, um, there, there are some advantages and disadvantages. And, um, you know, uh, I've talked to a lot of the teams, so I have an idea of what's going on. Obviously, I haven't been in the car yet, so I'm not exactly sure what to expect, you know, until I get out there. But um, the S2000 spec runs a 17-inch tire, um, along with, I believe it's a 235 profile, um, where the next generation cars are running an 18 inch, uh, rim with a 245 profile. So we have a little bit less rubber on the ground, a little bit more sidewall flex. Um, there's an advantage and disadvantage to that. The, uh, the advantage is, is that the S2000 cars actually get heat in their rear tires quicker. Uh, it's a smaller tire, less volume to heat up. So the first two or three laps of the race, uh, the S2000 cars have an advantage. And then once the race goes on, uh, tire wear, tire degradation becomes an issue. Towards the end of the race, that advantage starts shifting to the, uh, the next generation cars. And not to put you on the spot, Honda Civic won last year's championship. Was that an S2000 car or a new generation? The car I am in right now is the car that actually took second in the championships, Gordon Shedden's car. So, so no real excuse there. The, the, there are more next generation cars out on track right now than there were last year. Uh, the Hondas have now all gone over, other than the car that I'm running, to the next generation specification. And then uh, Jason Plato and his teammate have come out with the MG uh, cars as well. So you've got the, the top, I think, five cars in the series right now are the new generation of cars. But, uh, you know, I still think this car has got some life left in it. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easily a top top 10 car and, and and the last question on the car right now you're off turbo this is normally aspirated or are they no, no, no. these are turbocharged cars it's there's a, a general specification that the series has gone to and it's a your turbocharged motor for every car in class so it makes it a little bit easier performance balance the cars okay so let's segue there because you've got experience running a turbo race car production car what do you expect to happen you have not been in the car yet you're going to test maybe tomorrow uh, tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow morning. So, what do you expect from this new, from this this British touring car? I think it's going to be really similar to the Pirelli World Challenge touring cars that we had five or six years ago. Heavily modified suspensions, um, suspension pickup points, uh, all things that are designed to eliminate some of the the inherent issues with uh, front wheel drive race car. Uh, I think that you're going to start seeing the car that is going to be very precise. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a true race car. It's not it's it's more than just a heavily modified street car. There's all the suspension pickup points are changed. Um, all the suspension is is completely modified. So I think that it's going to be a much more enjoyable car to drive. I can really kind of you know grab it by the scruff of the neck and 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 make it do what I want it to do, as opposed to trying to figure out what it wants and uh, and go from there. There's a lot of adjustability in the car. Huge amounts of adjustability. That's one of the things that's going to be one of the. the learning curve uh, issues that I'll have to deal with is, is that there's even more um, adjustability in the car than the old touring cars. And some of the things, it, it, I, I won't know what it does until we actually make the adjustment. And we're going to be running, I think, four half an hour sessions tomorrow. It's, of course, in typical British summer fashion, it's supposed to rain nonstop all day long. So 
you know, it's a, uh, you gotta love it. You know, it's a, it's a track I've never been to and a car I've never driven before and, and a high profile series. And of course, what is it going to do? It's going to rain all day. Are you expecting sympathy from me on this or are you just going to? No, oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, where, what track are you testing? Is it going to be Snetterton or Knock Hill or no? It is Snetterton. Um, you know, our, my big thing was, is that I wanted to, to test on the track that we're going to go to, to try to minimize any disadvantages I had. The, one of the reasons I chose Centerton as the as the first race we were looking at doing is is they've just remod they've just modified the circuit uh, last year so it went from the traditional circuit and they've added a whole infield section which is uh, looks kind of fun. Yeah, the track map tells me it's really technical, a uh, combination of a lot of slow back and forth transition things, and then you you got a few sweepers and straightaways. But if you can drive the car and carry it, looks like a good place. Yeah. Well, and that's and that's the big thing is is that you also have to look at the way the series is performance balancing the cars is that they are looking at overall lap time. So they're not just saying, okay, uh, here's your trap speed, so we're going to modify your boost based on trap speed. They're saying, here's what the overall lap time is. The Hondas are actually much better on you know a very tight, twisty circuit. They don't have as much horsepower as the MGs or the BMWs. And it's this circuit is now with this new infield section, it's, it's technical, it, the kind of the balance changes back to the Honda. And I think we're going to have, if not an, an advantage, at least not a disadvantage. The other big thing was, is that these guys don't have a lot of experience on the circuit. You know, the circuit has, has only been in use for a year. So, you know, my big concern is, is that you, you come out here and, and until you get here, you never realize this, but um, almost everything is with a hundred miles of London. You know, you, you wear Brands Hatch, you know, 50 miles away from London, uh, you know, uh, Silverstone, you know, 100 miles away from London. So these guys, when you when they come out here and they say, oh, it's our home track. Well, their home track is, you know, is every track in, in, in England. So it, whereas in the U.S., you know, if I if I go to, you know, Watkins Glen, you know, I go to Watkins Glen once, maybe twice a year. Road America, I go to once a year. So, you know, I've got experience at those tracks, but nowhere near what these guys have at all their tracks. So, you know, for my first uh, first race, I wanted to try to balance that out a little bit, and, and this was a good place to start. That prompts a little racer question. Is this an open test or a private test? Uh, it is an open test. There'll be, I believe, three or four other BTCC teams there, um, along with, I believe, some Porsche Cup teams and some Genetic Cup teams as well. So um, I, I, there will be a lot of the British media out to, to kind of see my first uh, first uh, tentative laps in a, have, in a British team. Have you met some of your other competitors slash friends slash screw it, I'm not your friend, I'm a competitor yet? <laughs> Not yet. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I've uh, I've met a couple of the teams. I had talked to a few teams before. I had settled on uh, on Tony Gillen Racing for, for the program, and um, and they all seem to be great. And they're they're really excited to to have me in the series and, and an American as well. I think there's this this kind of you know wow we you know no one had realized that it's been that long since an American raced in BTCC. So everyone's kind of uh, excited and, and keeping an eye. Well, for what it's worth, from my side, racing's marketing as well as the the sport and. You've gotten a lot of press already being the guy going over there, so. Yeah, you know, it wasn't something that I expected. I, I, didn't, I didn't go to, to British Touring Car because, you know, I was going to be the first American in, in 37 years. Yeah, I didn't even realize that until we were pretty much done with, uh, with getting the deal finalized. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I just always loved British Touring Car from the, from the time, you know, it was back in the 90s when it was the Super Touring Car era. Uh, I just thought that was the best racing on the planet. So, you know, down the road, we find out that, uh, you know, I'm the first American in 37 years to, to run. And then you look at the very limited list of Americans who are running in the, in the Steve McQueens and the Dan Gurneys. And it's, it's a very, very uh, select list of, of American race car drivers. So hopefully this is, you know, it's great for me and, and getting out there and getting exposure, obviously, which helps with sponsors. But the, you know, the big thing is I'd like to see other, other Americans come over here and, and run. I think there are a lot of American touring car drivers that I think would do very, very well over here. Uh, let's go back to driving the car. Talk to me a little bit about how you actually do drive, race, a front drive car and how that affects whether it be your line, your inputs, braking, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge difference between driving a front-wheel drive car and a rear-wheel drive car. Uh, there are so many things you have to do to get a front-wheel drive car through a corner. Um, the, the big issue you've got, uh, especially in a, in a turbocharged car, is that all the weight sits over the nose of the car. And you end up having to, to fight to get the car to turn in. In addition, you know, you've got all of the steering forces going through the front tires, and then you're trying to accelerate as well. So 
that creates a condition what we call power on push. So as soon as you want to go to throttle, if you're using you know 90% of the tire's grip to get through the corner, you can only use the other 10% to go to throttle, which obviously doesn't get you out of the corner very fast. So you end up with this balancing game. Um, you know, one of the, the, the things that we do uh, a lot in, in running a front wheel drive car is trail braking the car into the corner, which is basically getting on the brakes late holding that brake all the way to almost the apex of the corner before we transition back on the throttle to get out of the corner. What that does is it weights the nose of the car and unweights the tail of the car, which then allows that tail to rotate. Um, in addition to that, we do a lot of adjustments with the suspension. So we like to try to do a little bit of toe out in the rear tires, you know, maybe an eighth or a 16th inch uh, toe out in the rear. And what that does is, is that as you actually weight the outside of that tire, that toe out helps that tire to steer the rear end of the car through the corner. Um, so you're basically just trying to trick the car into behaving like a rear wheel drive car. If you can do it, it's actually a very, very effective way of getting the car. And we, we do what we call pitch and catch. You basically pitch the car in there, get the car to rotate. And then once it's pointed down the straightaway, you can get the throttle. And sometimes, depending on the corner, you can actually get the throttle a little bit before a rear-wheel drive car. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of disadvantages to it. But if you can get the setup just right, I think there's a, there's a lot of advantages to it as well. Can I translate that, that there may be an advantage in terms of trying to pass a rear-drive car because you're braking all the way to the apex? Well, absolutely. And the, the other thing is, is with the BTCC is that, you know, they, they like their... Their motto is, is more rubbing is more racing. Do you expect the racing to be more aggressive? Yeah, absolutely. Um, British Touring Car especially, I mean, that's just how they race. It's what they've been known for over the years. Um, you know, and in the racing that I've done over here in general. Um, yeah, you definitely see a lot more aggressiveness that you don't see in the U.S. I think the U.S., everyone's kind of, you know, okay, excuse me, pardon me after you. And, and the, over here, it's more like I'm coming through, get the hell out of my way. And, uh, so it's, it's going to take an adjustment in that. And I think that's one of the bigger things that, you know, and, the, and you know, I talked to Ian Harrison who uh, runs the triple eight team out here, um, you know, both in British touring car and then also in the Aussie V8 supercar. And he said, that's the thing you're going to have to get used to. He says, you know, getting on pace with these guys, he says, it's probably not going to be an issue for someone who's got, you know, touring car experience. He goes, the issue is going to be racing with these guys. It's, it's a whole nother level of aggression that you just have to mentally prepare yourself for. If you watch BTCC, these guys, it, they go at it hammer and tong. And the, the thing with a front-wheel drive car is, is that you've got inherent stability in front-wheel drive. If the car kind of gets a little loose or a little twirly, you basically point the front wheels where you want them to go, get on the throttle, and usually the car will pull you through. In a rear-wheel drive car, if you unstabilize a rear-wheel drive car, they're just kind of hanging out. They can't go to throttle to help them. So, you know, in a rear-wheel drive car, in a race situation, you can get a lot more aggressive with a front-wheel drive car than you can with a rear-wheel drive I'm smiling because I wish YouTube would let me show right here Jason Plato's huge save. Remember? <laughs> yeah, got it. Yeah, Brands Hatch going down the that hill. That was it. You, you can't get any more perpendicular to the track than he was and just nail the throttle and just rid, basically rid it all the way down the hill and, and did an amazing save. Give the people that are new to British Touring Car a sense of how fast this car is, acceleration, top speed, and cornering. How many Gs will you get out of that, that Honda Civic? Yeah, mega fast. I mean, these cars, uh, I think they're probably three seconds a lap off of a uh, Porsche Cup car time. So they're they're basically small, small GT cars. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think that as far as top speed, um, you're probably looking, you know, at Centerton, I'm guessing 140 miles an hour on the front stretch. Uh, you know, and that's into a fairly heavy braking zone. So, yeah, I think these cars... Are, are very comparable to what we've got in terms of GT cars. And the thing that's amazing to me is, is, is how they compare to street cars. Uh, you know, people, you know, people uh, to a degree, I mean, they get out here, they get touring cars, but in the U S sometimes they're, no, it's a hot hat. You know, they're just little fun, little easy cars to drive. But when you actually go out and, and, and compare them to, you know, let's say a, a, a Porsche GT3 RS, um, you know, you, you turn maybe a, a two minute lap time for the Porsche GT3 RS. My touring car in, in World Challenge uh, will probably do that in a minute 55. So, five seconds faster than one of the faster street cars on the planet. So, I think that's, I think that's the thing that uh, I guess uh, most people wouldn't recognize about uh, the touring cars how, how insanely fast they are. And British touring cars are going to be probably five to six seconds quicker than that. And I have to remind everyone confirm for me. 
it may look smooth from the outside looking in, but you're aggressively throwing this car around and doing some really abrupt and, and very controlled but very hard things to make this car carry speed, yes? Yeah, oh, absolutely. We're, we're, like, uh, we're like ducks on the water, you know. On top, it's all calm and everything's good. And underneath, we're paddling away to save our lives. So it's, uh, it's, it's it, you really have to, to it, literally, it's you know, like Mario Andretti said, you drive it like you stole it. You grab the thing by the scruff of the neck, you throw it in the corner, and you just kind of figure out what you got once you get there. Well, Mario also said the guy that, uh, that's faster is the one that doesn't make less mistakes. He just catches the mistake sooner. So good on you. Get that done, okay? <laughs> There you go. So what are your, what are your ex expectations? I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. What are your expectations for these, these first two races? You know, you know, my philosophy in racing has always been, if you're not there to win, then why bother to show up? Um, you know, I, I don't want to come here and be pack filler. I don't want to be uh, the, the American and, and, okay, well, we can just discard him. And, um, you, know, I, you know, my goal is, is, is to be competitive with these guys, and I think we can be. Um, I think realistically a top 10 finish uh, for the first race weekend I think is, is, is a realistic goal to have um, but I hope to be far more competitive than that. I'd like to I'd like to you know shoot for podiums right away and if this works what's what's the plan I I, I know you can give me the standard answer but what, what is the sense of you want to want to turn this into a 2013 season or yeah I mean the, the plan is definitely 2013 this isn't just a hey let's go over and play around in, in you know British touring car and then go off and do something else it is definitely as a you know looking for this as a as, as a permanent fixture in the series um, I'm doing a lot more stuff in Europe in general uh, I've got a partner of mine my buddy Roland um, and I are buying a garage out of the Nürburgring and we're going to be doing a lot of uh, basically almost arrive and drive for American drivers in the VLN series, the Nürburgring race series over there and the 24 hours of Nürburgring. And, um, you know, I see this as kind of a, a doorway to American drivers coming over because I always get questions because I'm over here a lot. And uh, I think there's a, a pent up demand to come here, but drivers who just don't know how to go about it. And uh, so hopefully we can use this as a way to get, uh, you know, get guys over here easy. So I'm going to uh, kind of close this because I want you to get some rest for tomorrow, but I, I got to ask you, something on my agenda. Um, we have here something called Shakedown University, which has been our attempt to convey some of the racing knowledge. And I know you're an instructor here in the States and just told us what you're doing in Europe. I need you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. Okay, you gotta tell me what I'm repeating first before I raise my right hand. <laughs> well, we're about to make you an adjunct professor to Shakedown University. All right. Uh, I, Rob Holland. I, Rob Holland. Am now agreeing to become a member. Yeah, to become a member of the Shakedown University as an adjunct professor. Of Shakedown University as an adjunct professor. Uh, uh, so help me uh, someone. Uh, yeah. So help me Sterling yeah. Moss. So here's what I'd like to do. Somewhere in your experience, whether it's uh, from your testing or after one of the races, I'd love to do this again and have you take us through the debrief experience to share without ch sharing too many secrets, what a driver normally does when they get out of the car from a given session and, and confer knowledge and information from your experience racing the car to the engineers to make those changes we talked about. And just give people here on Shakedown kind of an inside look. If you're up for that, and I'm putting you on the spot, I'd love to do it. Ah, I think it'd be great, because this is going to be a learning experience for me as well. New teams, new cars, new engineers. So it, uh, I think this could be a lot of fun, absolutely. Well, I defer to you when you want to do it in the, in the three experiences. Uh, the, the testing tomorrow, uh, we'll let you do your thing, and maybe after one of the races, OK? Absolutely. Okay, all kidding aside, we wish you the best of luck. It's mega cool, and I know you're going to do great. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Leo. I appreciate it. Thank you for it. your time.